Chapter Five of the Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter Five, Into the Nightland. Now, after that destruction which had come upon the ten thousand, and the fresh assurance that was upon us of the terror of the Nightland, it may be known that there could be no more thought to succor, though in truth those youths that went now upon the road where the silent ones walk were far beyond our aid. Yet might it be thought that we should have signaled to them, calling by the home-call, which was that great voice which went forth from the machine above the sealed base of the mighty pyramid. But this we might not do, for then we gave signal to the monsters of that land that some were even now abroad from the pyramid. Yet we could no more than hope that the evil forces had no wotting of them, for in verity none might ever know the knowledge or the ignorance which those powers did possess. Yet it must be kept to the mind that we knew even then there was an influence abroad in the land, strange and quiet, so that the instruments did not more than make record of it. And as I have surely set down ere now, we had belief that it did come from that house of silence afar in the nightland, upon that low hill to the north of the great road. And many among the monster wakens feared that it was directed upon the youths, but of this there could be no surety, and we could but wait and watch. Now about this time those poor youths did draw nigh to that part of the road where the silent ones walk, where it turned more swiftly to the north and they to be now at no mighty distance from that grim and horrid house. And presently we knew that the influence had a greater power in the land, and I had an assuredness that it came from the house, yet no certain proof was this. But I set out my feelings to the master Monstruaken, and he had trust in them and in my power. Moreover, he also had belief within himself that some secret power came out from the house of silence. And some talk there was at times that we send the home-call into the night, to give warning to the youths of our knowledge and our fear, and to entreat them to make a safe endeavour to return swiftly. Yet this was an error, and refused by the master Monstruaken, for it was not meet that we put the souls of those youths in peril until such time as we had certainty that they should be lost if we did not bestir ourselves. For indeed this home-call was a mighty voice, calling over the world, and did have so exceeding a noise, that it had immediately told all that land how that some were yet abroad from the great redoubt. And here will I set down how that home-call had no use in those ages but we had a call in the olden time when yet the great flying-ships went abroad over the world. And there passed now a day and a night, and in all that time there ceased not great multitudes to peer forth into the nightland at the youths. For it was known concerning the influence, and all felt that the youths did draw nigh very speedy to their fate, and much talk there was, and many things said, and much foolish speech, and kind intent but no courage to go forth to make further attempt to rescue, which in truth calls not for great astonishment, as I have surely writ or oft thought. And in this place let me set down that the land was, as it might be said, waked and unquiet, and a sense of things passing in the night, and of horrid watchfulness. And there were, at this time and at that, low roars that went across the land and if I have not told the same before this time, it must be set to count against me and my telling, for, indeed, I should have writ it down before this place. Yet is the difficulty of my task great, and all must bear with me, and entreat for me that I have courage, so that I may come at last to strength and wisdom to tell all that I did see. Now in the space of this day and night it was known that the youths had not slept, neither had they eaten, save once, as they who had the watch through the great spy-glass did affirm. But they to hasten alway at a woeful speed towards the north, along that great dismal road, so that presently they must cease, or slay themselves with their endeavour. 
and all this did give surety to our fears that they were under a spell from that horrid house afar in the land, and we had an assurance that this thing was, for presently there came a monstruaken to the master monstruaken to report that there had come suddenly a mighty influence into the land, and in the same moment, as it might be, I spied through the great spy-glass and did see those youths break swiftly from the road where the silent ones walk and begin to run very swift that they might come quickly to the house of silence. Then did the master monstruaken hesitate not, but did send the home-call across the world, ay, even to those poor doomed ones that hastened unknowing to the terror which did compel them. And immediately upon the sound the master did send a message to the natural eye in set language and made warning that they suffered themselves to be drawn to their destruction by a force that came from within the house of silence. And he besought them to put forth the strength of their spirits and to battle for their souls, and if they could in no wise compass a victory over that which drew them onwards, to slay themselves quickly ere they went into that house to the horror of utter destruction. And in all the pyramid was there a great silence for the bellowing of the home-call bred a quietness, because of that which it did portend. And it was swiftly known by the millions that the master monstruaken did plead for the souls of the youths, and there went forth unknowingly a counter-force from the mighty pyramid, by reason of the prayers and soul-wishings of the countless millions. And the counter-force was plain to my inward hearing and beat all the ether of the world into a surge of supplication, so that it stunned my spirit with the great power of it. And it seemed to me, as it were, that there was a vast spiritual noise in all the night, and I spied tremblingly through the great spy-glass, and lo, the youths did cease from their swift running, and were come together in a crowd, and had a seeming to be confused, as might some who have waked suddenly from sleep, to find that they walked in their sleep and had come to a strange place. Then came there a great roar from all the millions that spied from the embrasures, from nigh five hundred thousand embrasures they did look, and I count not the great view-tables. And the shouting rose up to the roaring of a mighty wind of triumph, yet was it over early to sound for victory for the counterforce which came from the intensity of so many wills blent to one intent was break, and the evil force which came forth out of the house did draw the youths again, so that they heeded not their salvation, but turned once again to their running. And the mighty pyramid was full of a shaken silence, and immediately of lamentation and sorrow and horror at this thing. But in that moment there did happen a fresh wonder for there grew suddenly before those poor youths billows of mist, as if it had been of pure white fire, shining very chill, yet giving no light upon them. And the mist of cold fire stayed their way, so that we had knowledge that there fought for the souls of them one of those sweet powers of goodness, which we had believed did strive to ward our spirits at all times from those forces of evil and destruction and all the millions saw the thing, but some with a great clearness and many doubtful, yet were all advanced more in spiritual sight and hearing than the normal peoples of this age. But of them all none had the night-hearing to know a soul having speech in the ether half across the world. Yet, as I have said, some there had been aforetime who were thus given the hearing, even as was I. And there came a monstruaken to the master monstruaken to make report that the influence had ceased to work upon the instruments, and by this thing we knew that in verity the force which proceeded out from the house of silence was cut off from us, and from those youths. And we had assurance that there fought a very mighty power for the salvation of the souls of the youths. And all the peoples were silent, save for an underbreath of wonder and talk for all were utter stirred with hope and fear, perceiving that the youths had some chance given unto them to return. And whilst the youths yet wavered in their minds, as I perceived with the great spy-glass, and the knowledge of my soul, and of my natural wit, 
lo, the master monster Waken sent once more the great voice of the home call abroad into the land, and immediately besought those youths for the sake of their souls and the love which their mothers had for them to come swiftly homewards, whilst they had yet this great power to shield them and allow them sweet sanity. And I thought that some did look towards the pyramid, as that they answered to the mighty voice of the home call, and did read the message which the master monster Waken made to them. But in a moment they faced about, seeming to have a good obedience to one who did always lead, and of whom I had inquired and found to be one named Ashoff, who was a great athlete of the nine hundredth city. And this same Ashoff, out of the boldness and bravery of his heart, did make unwitting to destroy the souls of them all, for he went forward and leapt into the billows of the bright shining fire that made a barrier in the way of their destruction. And immediately the fire ceased from its shining, and gave way and sank and grew to a nothingness, and Ashoff of the nine hundred city began again to run towards the house of silence, and all they that were with him did follow faithfully, and ceased not to run. And they came presently to the low hill whereon was that horrid house, and they went up swiftly, and they were two hundred and fifty, and wholesome of heart and innocent, save for a natural waywardness of spirit. And they came to the great open doorway that hath been open since the beginning, and through which the cold steadfast light and the inscrutable silence of evil hath made for ever a silence that may be felt in all the land. And the great uncased windows gave out the silence and the light, ay, the utter silence of an unholy desolation. And Ashoff ran in through the great doorway of silence and they that followed, and they never more came out or were seen by any human. And it must be known that the mothers and the fathers of those youths looked out into the nightland and saw that thing which came to pass. And all the people were silent, but some said presently that the youths would come forth again, yet the people knew in their hearts that the young men had gone in to destruction. For in truth there was that in the night which spoke horror to the souls of all, and a sudden utter quiet in all the land. But unto me, that had the night hearing, there came a great fear of that which might be whispered into my spirit, out of the quietness of the night, of the agony of those young men. Yet there came no sound to the hearing of the soul, neither then nor in all the years that were to come. For in verity had those youths passed into a silence of which the heart cannot think. And here will I tell how that the strange quiet which did fill all the land, seeming to brood within the night, was horrid beyond all the roarings which had passed over the darkness in the time that went before, so that it had given my spirit some rest and assurance to hear but the far-echoing low thunder of the great laughter, or the whining which was used at times to sound in the night from the southeast, where were the silver-fire holes that open before the thing that nods, or the baying of the hounds, or the roaring of the giants, or any of those dreadful sounds that did often pass through the night. For they could not have offended me as did that time of silence, and so shall you judge how dreadful was that quiet which did hold so much of horror. And surely it will be known that none had thinkings now, even in idle speech, that any should have power to succor the peoples of the lesser redoubt. Neither, as I have said, had any the knowledge of the place where it did stand. And so it was made plain that those peoples must suffer and come unhelped and alone to their end, which was a sad and dreadful thought to any. Yet had those within the great pyramid come already to much sorrow and calamity because that some who had made attempt in this matter. And there had been for gain only failure and the sorrow of mothers, and the loneliness of wives and of kin. And now this dread horror upon us, which concerned those lost youths. Now, as may be conceived, this sure knowledge that we might give no succor to the people of the lesser redoubt, 
weighed heavy upon my heart. For I had, maybe with foolishness, held vague hopes and wonders concerning our power to make expedition secretly into the night, to discover that lesser pyramid and rescue those poor thousands, and above all, as may be thought, had I the thought of that sweet moment in which I would step forward out of the night and all mystery and terror and port forth mine arms to Nani, saying, I am that one. And knowing in my soul that she that had been mine in that bygone eternity should surely know me upon the instant, and call out swiftly and come swiftly, and be again unto me in that age, even as she had been in this and to think upon it, and to know that this thing should never be, but that, even in that moment of thought, she that had been mine in these olden days of sweetness, might be even then suffering horror in the power of some foul monster, was like a kind of madness, so that nearly I could seize the discos and run forth unprepared into the evil and terror of the nightland, that I should make one attempt to come to that place where she abode, or else to cast off my life in the attempt. And oft did I call to Nani, and always I sent the master word beating through the night, that she might have assurance that it was indeed I that did speak unto her spirit, and no foul thing or monster, spelling evil and lies unto her. And oft did I make to instruct her that never should she be tempted forth from the shelter of that redoubt in which she did live by any message out of the night, but always to await the master-word, and, moreover, to have a sure knowledge that none that was her friend would ever seek to entice her into the night. And this way and that way would I speak with Nani, sending my words silently with my brain elements. Yet was it doleful and weariful and dreadful always to have speech into the dark, and never to hear the answering beat of the master-word and the sweet, faint voice whispering within my soul. Yet once and again would I have knowledge that the ether did thrill about me, weakly, and to mine inward hearing it would seem that the master-word did beat faintly in the night, and thereafter would my heart have a little comfort, in that I had assurance of a kind that the love made of my memory dreams did still live and constant I put forth my soul to hark, so that my health failed me, with the effort of my harking, and I would chide my being that I had not a wiser control, and so make a fight to do sanely. Yet day by day did my heart grow more weary and restless, for indeed it did seem that life was but a very little matter against so great a loss as my heart did feel to suffer. And oft, at this time and that, did there come a voice speaking plainly out of the night, and did purport to be the voice of Nani. But ever I did say the master word unto the voice, and the voice had no power by which it could make the one answer. Yet I jeered not at the voice, to show contempt of its failing to bewit me. But let the matter bide, and the voice would be silent a time, and again would make a calling unto me but never did I make speech with it, for therein lies the danger to the soul, but always did speak the master-word to its silencing. And thereafter would shut the thing from my memory, and think only upon sweet and holy matters, as it might be truth and courage, but more often of Nani, which was both sweet and holy to my spirit and heart and being. And so it was as I have set down, there were monsters without in the night that did torment me, having, it may be, intent to lure me unto destruction, or indeed it doth chance that they had no hope but to plague me with malice. And, as may be thought, all this considering of my trouble and the giving of my strength unto Nani through the night of the world, that she might have comfort and help, did work upon me, so that I grew thin, plainly to the eye of those who loved me. And the master monster Wakin, he that did love me, as I were his son, chid me gently, and had wise speech with me, so that I but loved him the more, yet without having gain of health. For my heart destroyed me, as it doth if love be held back, and made always to weep. 
and it may be thought strange that my mother and my father did not talk also with me, but I had neither mother nor father those many years, and this thing I should have set down early, so that none should waste thought pondering to no end. But the blame is to my telling. Now concerning my love-trouble there did happen a certain thing which gave me to decide. For one night I waked from a sore troubled sleep, and it did seem that Nani did call my name, mine olden love name, and in a voice of utter anguish and with beseeching. And I sat up in the bed and set the master-word into the night, with my brain elements, and presently all about me there was the solemn beat of the master-word answering but weak and gone faint that scarce I might hear it. And I called again with my brain elements unto Nani that was Murdath, and spoke to give her assurance, and to haste to tell unto me that which was so wrong and pitiful with her. And who shall be amazed that I was shaken with the eagerness of my spirit, in that it was so long since Nani had spoken clear within my soul, and now behold her voice! Yet, though I did call many a time unto the everlasting night, there came no more the voice of Nani, speaking strangely within my spirit, but only at times a weak thrilling of the ether about me. And at the last I grew maddened with the sorrow of this thing, and the sense and knowledge of harm about the maid. And I stood upright upon my feet, and I raised my hands, and gave word and honour unto Nani through all the blackness of the night, that I would no more abide within the mighty pyramid to my safety, whilst she, that had been mine own through eternity, came to horror and destruction by the beasts and evil powers of that dark world. And I gave the word with my brain elements, and bade her to be of heart, for that until I died I would seek her but out of the darkness there came naught but the silence. Then I clothed me swiftly, and went up quickly to the tower of observation, that I might speak instant with the master monster Wakin, for my heart burned in me to intention, and to be doing speedily that which I had set upon myself to do. And I came to the master monster Wakin, and told all to him, and how that I did mean no more to suffer in quiet and to no end but to make adventure into the nightland that I find Nani, or perchance find a swift peace from this my long troubling. Now when the master monster Wakin heard that which I had to say, it sat heavily upon him, and he besought me long and many times that I refrain from this thing, for that none might achieve so great a task, but that I should be lost in my youth before many days were gone by. Yet to all this speech I said not, save that this thing was laid upon me, and even as I had promised, so should I make to act. And in the ending the master monster Wakin perceived that I was set to this thing, and not to be moved, and he did put to me how that I had grown to leanness with so much troubling, and that I should have wisdom to wait a while, that I put on my full strength. But even as I was, so would I go. And this I told to him gently, and showed how that the thing was meet and helpful to the safety of my soul. For that my strength was still in me, yet was I sweeter in spirit, because that I stood lean and pure, and much poor dross and littleness had been burned from me, so that fear was not in me. And all do I lay to the count of my love, which doth purify and make sweet and fearless the human heart. And because I was even as I have said, so was I the less in trouble of the forces of evil, for long and sore had been my preparation of spirit, and I wot that none had ever gone forth into the darkness, so long withholden from that which doth weaken and taint the spirit. And here let me set down how that the three days of preparation, which were proper to those that willed to go forth into the nightland, had for their chief aim the cleansing of the spirit, so that the powers of evil did have a less ableness to harm. But also it was, as I have said, that none should go forth in ignorance of the full dreadfulness of all that held the night. 
for it was at the preparation that there was made known certain horrors that were not told unto the young, and of horrid mutilations, and of abasements of the soul, that did shake the heart with fear, if but they were whispered into the hearing. And these things were not set down in any book that might be lightly come by, but were warded and safe-locked by the master of the preparation in the room of preparation. And, indeed, when I did hear that which presently I was to hear, I had wonder in my heart that ever any went out into the nightland, or that ever the room of preparation should have other than students that met not to go forth, but only to achieve some knowledge of that which hath been done, and mayhaps shall be once again. Yet, in verity, is this but the way of the human heart, and hath always been, and will be so in all the years for ever. For to adventure is the lust of youth, and to leave safety is the natural waywardness of the spirit, and who shall reprove or regret? For it were sorrowful that this spirit of man should cease. Yet must it not be thought that I do uphold fightings to the death or to mutilation between man and man, but rather do sorrow upon this thought. Now when the morrow came, if thus I shall speak of that which was outwardly even as the night, though changing alway within the mighty pyramid, I went unto the room of preparation, and the door was closed upon me, and I underwent the full preparation, that I might have full power and aid to come to success through all the terror of the nightland. And three days and three nights did I abide within the room of preparation, and upon the fourth day was mine armour brought unto me, and the master of preparation stood away from me, silent and with sorrow upon his face, but touching me not, neither coming anigh to aid me, nor having any speech with me, for none might crowd upon me or cause me to answer. And presently I was clad with the grey armour, and below the armour a close-knit suit of special shaping and texture, to have the shape of the armour, and that I might not die by the cold of the nightland. And I placed upon me a scrip of food and drink, that might keep the life within me for a great time, by reason of its preparation. And this lay ready to me with the armour, and was stitched about with the mark of honour, so that I knew loving women thus to speed me. And when all was done and made ready, I took up the discos, and bowed in silence to the master of the preparation, and he went towards the door and opened it, and signalled that the people stand back so that I might go forth untouched. And the people stood back, for many had crowded to the door of the room of preparation, so that I knew how that my story must be to the heart of all, in all the cities of the great redoubt, for to come unbidden anigh that door was against the lesser law, and that any erred in this matter betokened much. And I went out through the door, and there was a mighty lane of people unto the great lift and about the great lift, as I went downwards, did the countless million stand, and all in a great silence, but having dear sympathy in their souls. Yet loyal unto my safety, in that none in all the mighty pyramid did make speech unto me, or call me aught. And as I went downward through the miles, lo, all the ether of the world seemed to be surged with the silent prayers and speedings of those quiet multitudes and I came at last unto the great gate, and behold the dear Master Monstruaken did stand in full armour, and with the discos, to do me honour with the full watch as I went forth. And I looked at him quietly, and he looked unto me, and I bent my head to show respect, and he made silent salute with the discos, and afterwards I went onwards towards the great gateway. And they made dim the lights in the great causeway, that there should be no glare go forth into the land when the gate was opened. And, behold, they opened not the lesser gate within the greater for me, but did honour my journey, in that they swung wide the great gate itself, through which a monstrous army might pass. And there was an utter silence all about the gate, and in the hushed light the two thousand that made the full watch held up each the discos silently, to make salute. And humbly I held up the discos reversed, and went forward into the dark. End of chapter 5